Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. During his 37 years in the United States Army, Jack Keane earned four stars. Beginning his career as a paratrooper in Vietnam, he rose to command of both the 101st Airborne Division and the 18th Airborne Corps. In his final post, he served as the Army's Vice Chief of Staff. General Keane retired from active duty in 2003. In 2006, he and military historian Frederick Kagan helped to develop a new approach to the war in Iraq that would soon become known as the Surge. And in 2007, General Keene served as an informal advisor to his Army colleague, General David Petraeus, as General Petraeus put the Surge into effect. General Keene, thank you for joining us. Segment one, the Surge itself. We invade Iraq in March 2003. For three weeks, the war goes well. For four years, the war goes badly. And then as the surge is put into effect, the war goes well once again. So well that in all of Iraq last month, the number of American casualties was six. The surge itself in a moment, but first, those four years, why did the war go sideways for so long? Well, we made some fundamental mistakes. The first is we didn't understand the nature and character of the war itself. Secondly, we didn't truly understand the enemy. And these are things that, you know, strategists that we've all read for years tell us we've got to get right, right from the beginning. And as a result of that, we had the wrong strategy. We had what I call a short war strategy. It was designed to stand up a political representative government as quickly as possible. And get out. Tra train the Iraqi security forces so they could deal with the insurgency and get out. Problem, one is the Iraqi political maturity wasn't ready for that kind of representative government that quickly. And of course, the Sunnis did not participate, so there was no reconciliation. Secondly, the Iraqi security forces were not ready to deal with the size and scale of that insurgency. And then the third thing that happened was the enemy. The enemy exploited the vulnerabilities that we provided them. We were not protecting the people, conscious decision on our part, the Iraqis could not, and they exploited that vulnerability and were continuously increasing the violence year over year from 2003 all the way up to the crisis we had in 2006. Okay, let me g ask a basic question as a layman, member of the American public trying to assess those four years when the war went sideways at mm -hmm. best. On the one hand, we could argue that we should have known better, that all the things that you just mentioned now seem very obvious in retrospect. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's the argument put forward by my friend here at the Hoover Institution, Victor Hansen, that certain thing, that war is war and a certain amount is unforeseeable. That, for example, the Normandy landing, they had uh, the detailed about the, the tide tables. They knew the, they knew the first hundred yards extremely well, but had completely forgotten about the hedgerows inland. And we lost thousands of men in the hedgerows mm -hmm. because, True. but that's the nature of war. You're going to get things wrong. How much do you, in retrospect, blame the military establishment of which you were a part for failures in planning and for failures to foresee the nature of the conflict? Or was it they did the best they could and you must expect to learn as you go in any situation like this? Yeah, well, a couple of footnotes to yeah. that. First of all, the, in most of the wars that we have been engaged in, from the Revolutionary War, Civil War, uh, World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam, some exceptions, but most of the wars we've been involved in, we get off on the wrong foot. And that, that is the nature of war, and it's also the history of American involvement in war. However, the American character of war has always demonstrated a certain intellectual flexibility that translates into an operational adaptability. And Churchill, a paraphrase of his comment is, you know, these Americans, they exhaust all the alternatives. And, and, then, then, they do the and then when they figure it out, they go right to the solution. Right. So, off on the wrong strategy here as we had been uh, in the past. And we were all contributing to it. I contributed to myself when I was in uniform and also I was on Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, Defense Policy Board. So I was supporting that strategy for most of, most of those years. So I'm part of, of that and I don't want to separate myself from it to be frank about it. But the, the good news here is we were able to figure out what was wrong with the strategy and even more importantly, what we needed to do to, right. to succeed. The search. Let's discuss both the aim or the end <clears throat> and the means. 
uh, the end. And I'm going to quote here from an article that you and Fred Kagan published in the Weekly Standard in December 2006. Quote, the key to success is changing the military mission. Instead of preparing for transition to Iraqi control, that mission should be to bring security to the Iraqi people. Close quote. Explain that. Yeah, our mission in the past had been to train the Iraqi security forces, bring them up, bring them to an acceptable level so they could deal with the insurgency. One of the things when we were trying to change the strategy and communicating to the President of the United States and also to the Vice President, I know one of the things that resonated is when I, when I said this, we do not have a plan to defeat the insurgency. And that is a pretty dramatic statement in of itself particularly when the leaders of our country are advocating victory, but I'm not certain they truly understood, I'm talking about national political right. leaders, truly understood that the military plan was not to defeat the insurgency, to transition to the Iraqis so they could. The, the, the proven practice of defeating an insurgency is to protect the population. And we were not doing that. Why? Because it would require increased number of troops, a rather dramatic change in mission. Right. Can I, what we discussed is the end, here's the means from the same article. We need a search of at least 30,000 combat troops lasting 18 months or so. Any other option is likely to fail, close quote. At the time, December 2006, sending in 30,000 more troops seemed like a big deal. On the other hand, from this remove, uh, you look back at the beginning of the war, Shinseki was saying we needed several hundred. How is it that you only needed, you felt that you only needed an additional 30,000 to get the job done. Right. That's a good question. Well, a couple of things. Number one is we, we actually needed, in terms of brigades, about eight to ten brigades, there were only five brigades available. So we, we had a finite availability of troops to deal with. We mitigated that. In all the armed forces of the United States, all that we had in reserve that could be deployed to Iraq was five in a, in a timely fashion to make a difference. All right. That was, that was the issue. And so a brigade is roughly? Three to 5,000, 5, depending right. on the type of brigade we okay. have. And then there are, there are enablers that come with it. There's aviation, there's logistics, some other things that bring those numbers up to the, the number that you're discussing. So that's, okay. that, that's the issue in terms of the, the troop ceiling. But here's the other thing. From January of 2007 to December of 2007, we put 125,000 Iraqi security forces on the street that were not there the year before. And it never has received the kind of attention it deserves to get because that in itself was a very dramatic surge in Iraqi security forces, which certainly added to what the Americans and the coalition forces already had. Segment two, chain of command. In Bob Woodward's book, The War Within, he describes how Fred Kagan, who was then, as I recall, in his 30s, uh, former instructor at, the, at West Point, then at the American Enterprise Institute, a think tank in Washington, Fred Kagan assembles a team of civilians to help him devise a new strategy for Iraq. Woodward describes your first briefing from Fred Kagan, quote, Keene left the briefing convinced that it carefully and systematically answered the question of how additional U.S. troops could be used to protect the Iraqi population, close quote. Here's the question, General. This is baffling. To me, how was a small group of civilians able to succeed where the vast resources of the Pentagon had failed? Well, first of all, there was not only civilians there, there were there were military in the room as well. Okay. He had retired military and he had a, a couple of active duty military as well. Nobody over the rank of uh, colonel. There were two generals who were there, uh, okay. General okay. Dave Barnum. So he's got military so. expertise, but he, over here yeah. we have the vast resources of the Pentagon, and over here we have Fred Kagan, soon to be joined by Jack Keane, and Skunk Works. And these are the guys who devised the strategy that saves our bacon. Correct? That's essentially correct. And the so problem how did that happen? The problem with it is, is we were wedded to an old strategy, and we just couldn't get ourselves off of that page. And uh, look at the guys that were involved in that. Uh, I mean, they're my friends, and and I understand how painful this is. But the fact is, sometimes you devise a campaign plan, and you start filling in the blanks with what you believe, you know, are the positive things that are happening, and you may not be dealing with and mitigating the, the negative things that are happening. The, 
the, the issue, the fundamental issue that we had is that the we enemy, as you and Fred Kagan? No, we, we collectively, the okay. United States had, is that the enemy had voted on the previous strategy and was increasing the level of violence every year to a staggering rate of violence in 2006, which was pushing the Iraqi newly formed government to a fractured state and possibly a failed state. And that level of violence was the enemy's mantra. And they looked at it as a center, center of gravity. And we never stopped that level of violence increasing every year. If we had done that sooner, we would not have had the crisis that we had in 2006. Here, uh, I'm probing a little. Here's another piece of this that Woodward goes into in his book, The War Within, that puzzles me. Um, beginning December 2000, you and Kagan publish a piece together in the Weekly Standard. You've got a plan. And you begin, Cheney brings you into the White House, and you begin briefing folks in the White House, including the president. And by January 2007, the president buys off on the surge. He announces it. In the late summer of 2007, according to Woodward, President Bush asked you to deliver a message to General Petraeus. Why? Because Petraeus is in Iraq trying to execute the surge, and he's running into constant resistance from the Joint Chiefs back home. You're retired. You're an informal back channel. And the chiefs are trying to keep you from seeing Petraeus. So the, you write down the president's words. The president himself speaks to you directly. You write down his words. You drive to Fort Myer and read them to General Petraeus, quoting the president. Your, for your notes on what the president said. I want Dave to know that I want him to win. That's the mission. He will have as much force as he needs for as long as he needs it. Woodward continues. After hearing the president's message, Petraeus told Keene, I wish he'd tell CENTCOM and the Pentagon that, close quote. Why didn't the President of the United States tell CENTCOM and the Pentagon that? What does it tell us about the conduct of that war, about what it's like for the Chief Executive of the United States to try to conduct a war, that in some strange way he felt he had to use a back channel to his own commander? What's going on there? I don't have a good answer for the why of it. I, I have an opinion about it, certainly, because I was involved in it. The president made what I believe was a courageous decision to change the strategy in Iraq in January of 2007 over the opposition of, of some of in his White House, certainly people in his party, and overwhelmingly uh, people in the Democratic Party. He had the Iraq Study Group report that had come out in the summer which he could have... Two former Republican secretaries of state, Jim Baker right. and Larry Eagleburger, giving him cover for getting out of he Iraq. He could easily have crawled underneath that and, and used that as cover, but he did not because he still wanted to win. And he understood, I think, very clearly the dire consequences of failure in Iraq and what it meant for regional instability and also what it meant for the security of the United States. And he was not letting go of it. So I, I respect him for that conviction. I don't think he gets the kind of credit he deserves okay. for it. But now that the policy decision is made and Petraeus is put in place and almost from the beginning he's getting browbeat by his chain of command above him um, in terms of pushing him to, to reduce to forces, not go to, uh, don't keep those forces there, you know, beyond 2007. They were asking him, the way staffs beat up on subordinates is they ask them, the way commanders beat on subordinates, they use their staff to run analysis and options and things like that. An incredible amount of staff work was being done to do that. And in my mind, they were undermining the decision that had been made. And I thought it was pretty unfortunate for Petraeus and his first four-star command dealing with a difficult situation to try to turn this crisis around and the chaos that, that he was given. And at the same time, not being supported in that after a president had made a decision for him to do exactly what he was doing. So I tried to provide him assistance with that and let people know that what was taking place. The, the message uh, from the president, I don't, for the life of me, I don't know why I urged people to do it. I don't know why the president just didn't bring the national security team together and say something like this, look at guys, I've made a decision. It was a tough decision. Reasonable people could disagree with me, but we got a decision. We're executing American troops' lives are at stake here, and I expect everybody on the team 100%. If you can't leave, if I catch you undermining this decision in the future, then I'm going to ask you to leave. 
now let's get on this team and let's support what I'm doing. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that meeting that never took place. W- ever took place. Even in 2007, that wasn't right. taken. Okay. Segment three, Iraq Today. This past March, President Obama announced the new Iraq policy, a couple of principal points. The American combat mission will officially end by April of 2010, and of the 142,000 American troops now in Iraq, about 100,000 will be withdrawn pretty quickly, leaving up to 50,000 in Iraq to advise Iraqi forces until 2011. But by the end of 2011, at the latest, virtually all American troops will come home. General Petraeus, President George W. Bush, others used to oppose our announcing any timetable for withdrawal. The new commander-in-chief has just done so. Your view? Well, none of us really wanted a, a timetable for the obvious reasons, because you don't want your enemy to be able to keep track of you know, what you're doing. But nonetheless, there is a status of forces agreement that two years with from With the Iraqi now, government. With the Iraqi government, between the United States government and the Iraqi government. It, it is a timetable, obviously, because our forces are going to leave by 2011. What's not, what we did not have in the past is exactly how many forces we would be leaving each year. We wanted that to be in the hands of the commanders. But overall, I think the president's decision. President Obama. Correct. President Obama's decision that, that he has made in concert with the generals uh, is, a, is a good decision. You do? I do. And I, I support it. The... I mean, I would rather not see the timetable in there, but I understand, you know, why it's there. And the Iraqis are asking for it. And Pretty hard to resist that, right? And we will have sufficient forces in 2009, is what the commanders were very concerned about. Do not do precipitous withdrawal in 2009 before we finish these other political events. There's district and sub-district elections coming. There's a national election at the end of the year. We just had a, an election in January, and there's also, they were going to attempt to resolve the Kirkuk Kurd dispute over boundaries and oil, Oil, and then there's going to be a status of forces agreement referendum that the people will vote on this summer. A lot of major political hurdles to overcome U.S. force presence provides a glue to assist with that and the objectivity that takes place in doing that. The other thing the commanders wanted is they wanted to make certain that in 2011 there was a sizable force presence there, and the president has granted them that some 50,000. It's pretty close to the status of forces agreement is what it really is. All right, so it's good enough. It is. This war is won. Yes, it is. It is won. Uh, Professor Fuad Ajami quote, as President Obama does battle in the wider theater of the greater, greater Middle East, he will have to draw the proper lessons of the Iraq campaign. General, give me one or two or three. What are the proper lessons to draw from our experience in Iraq? Well, first of all, I mean, going to Iraq, to first, we, we went there on the basis of flawed intelligence. Now, admittedly, there were other intelligence agencies that contributed to this, but it, it was fundamentally flawed intelligence. And I think there's been a number of mechanisms that have been put in place to try to make certain we don't make that kind of a mistake again. Second, You believe the American intelligence operations are better today than they were in uh, 2001, 2003 when we invaded? I you're, don't know. To be, to, they, I don't have okay. the visibility of it, to be frank about it, that I used to have. And I'm not trying to dodge the question. I just right. don't know. I want them to be, certainly. We've been putting enough emphasis on it. We've got some excellent people Do you people suspect that it. all we've done is rearrange the pieces of the... In- are you a little worried that there's no real substantive change in the intelligence operations? I worry about it. Certainly, I do. Uh, but I also know that there's some, been some dramatic all improvement. Right particularly uh, in the National Security Agency under uh, General Keith Alexander and some of the results that that he has been able to achieve has been significant in in the breakthrough technology that that he has used. We can't talk very much about it, obviously, because the class... So Intel's better. I think in general sense. Pretty likely, pretty likely to be better. But we missed the nature and character of the war that followed after that, you know, after the invasion. And that certainly is a a major lesson learned. and you have to make up your mind what kind of war are you fighting and then what are you, what are you, you trying to achieve with that, which has you know, direct application to what we're doing in Afghanistan. Well, let, me, let me give you sort of the, the question of questions. March 2003 to March 2009, six years of war in Iraq, bitter divisions in the United States, a death toll of more than 4,000 Americans and some 100,000 Iraqis. Was the war in Iraq, taking it all in all, was the war in Iraq worth it? 
The straight answer is absolutely yes. In terms of what we will achieve from it, we have among the 22 Arab Muslim countries, the only one that elects its government and is able to hold its government accountable in the region. That is, that is significant and it will forever change the, the region itself. The Iranians are big losers here, significant strategic losers, and Iraq does not want to be aligned with Iran. A Iraq wants a long-term political, economic, cultural, and military relationship with the United States of America. It will be a buffer against the Iranians. The other thing is that the Sunni Arab states that surround Iraq and are also south of it on the Arabian Peninsula, by and large, are all absolute monarchies where the people cannot hold those regimes accountable. They certainly give them financial stipends and they Spread pretty, much, the oil stay money in, here they there, pretty right? much stay in line. Those Sunni Arab countries are gonna be affected by this Arab Muslim democracy in Iraq as it prospers and grows and takes hold of itself. And I believe it will have positive political ramifications in the region. Therefore, the region is more secure as a result of a independent, uh, fledgling democracy in Iraq. The United States is more secure as a result of that stability in the region and it is absolutely worth what was expended to achieve those kind of results. All right. Segment four, Afghanistan. Last month, President Obama added some, announced that we would be adding some 17,000 troops to the 34,000 troops already in Afghanistan. Listen to a couple of quotations. First, President Obama, quote, the situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan demands urgent attention. Second quotation, military analyst and West Point professor Corey Shockey, in shifting forces from Iraq to Afghanistan, quote, Obama may pull the plug on a war we're winning in Iraq to concentrate on a war we cannot win in Afghanistan, close quote. Well, Your a couple, couple of issues. First, sure. he, did, he has not pulled the plug on the war uh, in Iraq. So that's You've already made clear you're, you're satisfied yeah. with the he plan for Iraq. He has not pulled Iraq. the plug. All that, right. That's fine. Secondly, we definitely can win the war in Afghanistan. Now look at this. This war has been distorted. It, it became the good war in the rhetoric leading up to the presidential election. Iraq became the bad war. And as a result of that, there's a lot of... But, but, uh, what, one thing I'm interested in there, you're anticipating a question. Let me just ask you now. That's sh for sure the case. On the Democratic side, Afghanistan is where we should be concentrating. Iraq was a mistake. On the Republican side, it was almost the other way around. We've got to win in Iraq. We've got to win in Iraq. Afghanistan, we can worry. What is that, just politics? Or was one side actually correct about it, more correct than the other? How well, do you I think it's, it's true, if I could take the politics sure. out of it. We had to finish what we had started and the momentum we had achieved in Iraq. And in, in Iraq, it is about a peacekeeping mission now and political maturity and growth All right. and less about security. The insurgencies defeated, the Al-Qaeda had defeated. The, in Afghanistan, it was always a secondary mission because of the, the scale of the mission in Iraq. It, and when the Taliban reemerged a couple of years ago, they started to get some traction because we just did not have enough resources, principally troops, but also the money that we were putting in there, the training of the Afghan National Army. Now, all that said, there is not a major calamity in Afghanistan. There is a rising Taliban influence, and the momentum is moving in a negative direction. That is true, but it's not threatening the legitimacy of the regime. They're not about to overthrow the country. It was not anywhere near the scale of the problem we had in 2006. That doesn't diminish in, the in problem. In Iraq in 2006. Yeah, right. in Iraq in 2006. It doesn't diminish the problem. We do have a problem, but it, it is not of crisis proportions that many would have us believe. And I also, in looking at it and analyzing it, it is very doable. It'll take us a couple of years to shift priorities from Iraq, which are appropriate now to do, to Afghanistan. We have to decide what is our strategy. It's appropriate that the president is doing that. It's appropriate that Dave Petraeus is doing that. We have to put a joint campaign plan together in support of that. We should take the time to be thoughtful about how we do that. We have to get our headquarters organizations better aligned than what they are. And then, then we must increase the, force, the forces. That's true. But we also have to increase civilian capacity and we have to put some money into this place. And in time, we can stabilize that country 
and drive the Taliban, not out of it, but drive them to a negotiating table with the reconcilables among them. There'll be some irreconcilables, just like we have in Iraq, that you'll never be able to deal with. You said we need to, dis to decide our strategy in uh, Afghanistan. Listen to President Obama on the war in Afghanistan during a recent appearance on 60 Minutes. Quote, what we're looking for is a comprehensive strategy. There's got to be an exit strategy. There's got to be a sense that this is not perpetual drift, close quote. By comparison with the way President Bush talked about Iraq, there's a very striking word missing from the way President Obama talks about Afghanistan, and the word is victory. Mm -hmm. And my question to you as a man who, uh, who commanded is, what does that do to the folks who are trying to develop the strategy? What does it do to commanders in the theater when it, the president, the commander in chief, is not talking about a victory? He's talking about an exit strategy. He's talking about it. It sounds as from the way the, the president's rhetoric, just judged on rhetoric alone, all you can be sure about is that President Obama doesn't want to lose. You can't be sure that he wants to win. Do you see what I mean? Sure, I understand. Is that a serious matter or, do, or doesn't it bother you? They'll, they'll, well, they'll fix it. The, it has to do with the nature of these wars. I mean, there, there is, there's a body of thought that these wars, because they are wars about the people and that clashes between armies, that there's a lot of ambiguity to them. Warlords and, fighting, there's got the you, drug trade going on, the long history of the Pashtuns who are divided between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And some people look at this and say, oh, well, the, it's the just fact a is, mess. if when you do win, your enemy doesn't surrender to you and you have a sign a peace treaty or there's a white flag ceremony or something to that effect. Look what happened in Iraq. We right. defeated the mainstream Sunnis. They, they didn't leave the battlefield traditionally the way insurgents leave. They came into the political process, their leaders, which is the best possible outcome. Certainly there's no kumbaya event signaling their defeat. The Shia-dominated government doesn't want to do that. They've got the best of all possible outcomes. Their former opponents are now in the political process. Why? Because they believe that there's something in that political process for them to gain political leverage and opportunity in the country. That is a positive outcome. We may not get that kind of outcome in Afghanistan to the degree that the Taliban will participate in the political process, but the reconcilables, I believe some of them will move into that and see that opportunity. In, I will still believe you can talk in, in terms of victory and winning these amb ambiguous wars as opposed to the conventional wars where armies surrender. And I don't think we should shy away from using the term as long as, long as we understand the complexity and the character and nature of the war. I think the president clearly understands the, ca the complexity and the character and nature of the war, so much so that it's a, a little intimidating because it protracts the war. He knows it's going to take time, and he also knows that political support for the war over time, given our own history and other people's history, will diminish. All right. That's the reality of it. So I think it's okay. I would prefer us to be a little clearer with it at times, and I don't think we should run from those terms because you can win these wars, and this war is winnable. All right. Segment five, our final segment, unfortunately. The mind of a four star. How do you think about certain problems? We've talked about Iraq. We've talked about Afghanistan. Let's talk about force structure. You say you're quoted in the Woodward book as saying that wars break armies and that they have to be rebuilt and that when you go into a war, you know you're going to have to rebuild afterwards. So um, what, for, what should our force structure look like now or in the, in the coming years? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Gentile, chairman of the American History Program at West Point, in a lecture last year, quote, due to the five years in Iraq and six years in Afghanistan, I believe that the U.S. Army has become a counterinsurgency only force. Much too much emphasis on counterinsurgency. Have we become preoccupied with the threat of terrorism and insurgency? Are we ignoring more conventional threats like the growth of China? Or is the Army doing about what it ought to be doing? No, the answer to that is, is yes. We do have some serious issues in terms of our focus. Obviously, we're fighting a war, and we, we didn't select the kind of war. Our opponent did that, and that will continue for some years because our opponents recognize that for a, the most preeminent conventional military that's ever been established, one of its vulnerabilities 
is to fight very decentralized against people with rifles and machine guns and explosive devices who fight at a time of their choosing and protract the war. It disarms your technology. So we're going to see this again. And as a result of that, our ground forces are pretty occupied with the two wars that we're involved in. And it's true that they have not had the opportunity to maintain the conventional skills that they normally have. That is, uh, skills to be able to defeat other armies, other ground forces, with the assistance of the other services. However, the Air Force and the Navy, while participating in this war with some forces, are largely not involved in the war with most of the mainstream forces. So their, their skill sets towards conventional operations are still there and honed to a razor's edge. The problem with the ground forces, because I think the American people have a right to ask a question, well, why can't we do both? Why can't we do this war and also be ready for a conventional war? The problem is the ground forces are too small. We dug deep into the muscle when we cut back almost 40% after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. And that, that cutting into the muscle was finished about 1998. These ground forces are too small. We should be able to fight wars of this size, which are not particularly large. It ain't World War II. And also maintain a residue of force that is training for conventional operations. Obviously, the people would switch out and some of the units would, but you would always have some units set aside that are preparing for conventional operations. And right now, we're not doing that. It's the size of the force that is really the issue. And it's not that the leaders don't have the will to do it. They, don't, they clearly understand the issue. They, it worries them. So you would say to President Obama, look, in your $3.6 trillion budget buster, you should have included about $500 billion more for the Pentagon. Well, the Pentagon... We need to take it from at least 4% of GDP in time of war to 45 or even 5% so that we can do both, fight these wars and keep ourselves at conventional strength. Well, you right? introduced another subject there, but yes, one is we have to grow the size of the ground forces and spend the money to do that, and I believe we can, we can recruit for it. Secondly, we have mortgaged, the truth be known, the, the future of the Air Force and the Navy somewhat in their modernization programs to pay for this war. So they have, they have some bills that need to be paid. Then the ground forces equipment itself, we've been burning this out over these last seven years. And that needs to be taken care of. So there are many bills inside the Pentagon that are not going to be addressed by the current budget, and I think that's a mistake. All right, General John Abizay, there are ways to live with a nuclear Iran, close quote. What do you think? Well, I certainly, I do not want Iran to have nuclear weapons. That's a fact, and, and nobody does. Are we, but, is, there, is there a military option for preventing them from getting nuclear weapons, either on the part of the United States or Israel, or are we already past that? I don't believe the military option is as realistic as people believe it is. I think you can delay the development of nuclear weapons. Look, there's a number of sites. Some of them are deep and buried sites which require significant penetration. And we may not be able to get to all of those sites. I, I doubt if we know where all the sites are. We would obviously f focus on your, the enriched uranium sites as a, as a priority, but we would what the military would do, you have to understand the limits of military action. Mm -hmm. It would delay the development of those weapons for X number of years. Now, that may buy you more time politically to be able to achieve some diplomacy and, and, and put some pressure on it. The problem with that is once you, you attack unprovoked, you give the Iranians a moral descendancy, you put them in the victim category, and they start to gain support not lose support from other, from other nations uh, in the world by some kind of unilateral action or mutual right. action between the United States and, and the Israelis. And you know, our, our national leaders certainly understand this issue, and, and it's a complicated, leave it alone. very leave tough it, Leave it alone. Keep working with. it diplomatically, but don't, don't, don't. I think don't. you keep the military option on the, on the table as a pressure point dealing with the Iranians, and if you're going to use it, just make sure you want, you understand the limits, certainly, and our leaders would understand that, of, of what that military option uh, would entail. Right. Final question. Watching this program somewhere, there's, um, there's an 18-year-old wondering whether to sign up, whether to join the armed forces of the United States. At this moment, when we're in combat in two wars, when the resources are strained, as you've just mentioned, 
What do you say to that young man or young woman? Yeah, welcome. Because it is uh, the military that we have on the battlefield today, and particularly familiar certainly with the ground forces because of the preoccupation of the two wars, is just so extraordinary. They, they, they've been in combat you know, since 9-11. That means that all of our senior captains and new majors, they've known nothing but war. It, we've been deploying since 1989 on an average of eight, every 18 months during the 90s. That's 20 years. So our colonels have been on operational deployments for almost 20 years. In my army that I was in, uh, in my formative years, we went 15 years and did nothing. And that was a good thing, certainly. I'm not suggesting that we wanted to do something, but you look at the resiliency of the officers and the non-commissioned officers and the career force and what they have been dealing with. It is enormous. Their morale is very high. Actually, it's sky high. Uh, Why? Th their performance is... Because we got Iraq right finally? Why were there... Well, because they, f they have a sense of purpose about what they're doing, and they, they respond to a call to duty, and they have strong feelings about it. There are different motivations for people joining, but as they get into the culture of the military, I'm absolutely convinced, having lived this life, we strengthen the values that they, they bring to us. And the team that, that comes out of that... Is, is fascinating to watch psychologically in terms of the sense of purpose and mission that they have and desire to do it right and get it right. But on top of that, after 9-11, where our morale in the past in the 90s had always been high in Bosnia, Somalia, Haiti, and the rest of those places, the fact of the matter is, post 9-11, it became all about America for the first time, all about the American people for the first time. And the soldiers and leaders actually verbalize that to you. They, they tell you, so it's about the American people. In their minds, in a general sense, being overseas in Afghanistan and in Iraq, fighting the kinds of enemies that we were fighting, they believe directly influenced the security of their loved ones and the United States and the treasures that we have back there. They draw that sense of purpose to what they're doing and it enriches their lives in terms of having a satisfying life and making a sacrifice for a greater good and a greater whole. Who wouldn't want to be a part of something like that? And the kind of internal feeling that you have about your sense of worthiness as a human being is pretty remarkable. And the resiliency that they have demonstrated is, is better than anything that we have experienced in the United States military. So we are so far from breaking this force. Those comments I made had to do with people who said this force was going to break, and I believe it was not going to break then and certainly not going to break now. General Jack Kane, thank you very much. Okay. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.